welcome to Drinks Coach. Yeah. 8.30 in the evening, Vine Sack, Drinks Coach, UK, lowercase. What week is it this week? Is it someone's important birthday? Probably somewhere. It's English Wine Week. That's what it is. English Wine Week. I think we had English Day and we had English Afternoon and English Weekend already this year. Uh, you can't can't try a brother for trying. Um, it's um, yeah. Uh, it's another promotional activity. Um, because of the horrible experiences we're going through, uh, we should just push any cynicism aside and just support English wine. And we know that every year they're getting better. So I just thought I'd swing a leg and just go around the, the, the flat and look in different nooks and crannies and racks, trying to find odd bottles of wine which I hadn't opened, um, which just sat there for a while. And uh, I thought I'd pick out a couple of weirdos. Um, and despite trying to go as weird as I could, these wines seem perfectly good to me. So... Let's start off with the first one. This is Giffords Hall Rosé. Um, I did a show on Bacchus not long ago. Um, if you'd like to look back to English Wines Bacchus, it would be like episode 20, below, something like that. But it's very close, close. And also, those wines are all available. So you can actually see below in the content if you're online on YouTube all the information you need to know or if you're on a tablet. Um, so, uh, Giffords Hall... They're actually near Bury St Edmunds, so they're right out in Suffolk, which seems an extraordinary long way north for winemaking to occur. Well, I'd just like at this point to add the fact that the English Wine Week is always very quick to also put in brackets, oh, and Wales, yeah. So um, I don't want people to forget Wales this time. So it's the England and Wales Wine Week. Um, it's amazing how far north you can make good wine, especially sparkling wine. There's a producer called Montgomery, <clears throat> 900 feet up a hill near Powys, actually an area that I go to travel to quite often with my wife because we think um, Snowdonia National Park is so beautiful. That whole area of Mid Wales is amazing. And they make a wine there from Saval Blanc, which is a variety which has taken quite well to the UK climate, and a variety called Pinot Noir Precoce. And it makes a almost champagne quality um, uh, fizz. Very, very good wine. Um, so if you can make really good wine halfway up Wales, you can certainly make good wine in Suffolk too. And uh, it's probably best known for making Bacchus, actually, uh, which is a variety which was really originally planted in East Anglia. But this wine is a different wine, and I have their reds to prove it. Um, most rosé is usually made for one of three reasons. Number one, because you're from a very famous region that makes rosé, so you actually produce, you get a vineyard with your all varieties, Sanso Grenache, and you make a wine which is rosé. That is to say, you put the skins, the whole grapes, into the wine, and as the wine ferments for about 24 hours, the wine starts to go pink, then you press the wine. And then you end up with a rosé, a very pale rosé. That's reason number one. Reason number two, it could be because you're in somewhere like England, for example, where it's just too cold to make anything else. And climates have changed, and that's simply not the case anymore. But when I started into wine, uh, going back 20, 30 years, um, the climate was a lot colder, simply. And uh, um, a lot of wines which would have been a Pinot Noir, they might have been growing a grape variety like that, um, which is um, okay for making wines and, and, and can make quite ripe-tasting wines in quite cool climates, but doesn't have much colour. So you'd end up with a rosé anyway. So they planted varieties called Tanchurier varieties, Rondo, Triomphe d'Alsace, um, uh, Ancien Noir, um, certain varieties which actually had red skins inside. So you ended up making a wine that was black or a wine that was red just because the juice was the right colour. But these wines weren't fully ripe, so they were qu quite edgy, quite sappy and chewy and hard work. So what's reason three for making rosé? Well... If you're going to try and make a Pinot Noir, especially with the climate and the summers we've been having, the summer we're having right now, I don't remember it being 31 degrees regularly in England when I was growing up, so things have changed. But in order to give the wines a bit of a boost, the uh, wine is made like this. You've got a white wine, you have the red grapes in it, so you've got when you squeeze the juice, white wine comes out, but the skin is where all the colour is. And you allow the wine to get darker and darker as the alcohol bleaches the colour of the skins out. So a wine starts off white and gets increasingly darker during the fermentation. At some point or other, you can take the skins out. What you can also do is actually take some of the wine out early on. Why? That there's more colour in the skins to stain the amount of wine that's left behind. So if you take 20% of the vat out, 
20% of the liquid volume out, then the wine is going to be 20% darker. Do you get my get, get my drift? So that's the point. And this wine is called a rosé saignée. And this is how most rosé on earth is made. It's made as a byproduct to, byproduct to make the red wines more concentrated. Here we are, Exhibit A, Giffords Hall. But also, it's not only made from the leftover Pinot Noir, because they don't make much red, but they do make a remarkably decent red, considering how far north it is. But the Pinot Noir that's been bled out of the vats, saignée meaning bleeding, has been blended with a beautiful grape variety called Madeleine Angevin, which I think is one of the more underrated, more exciting grape varieties which we're using in this country. Again, it's a variety you don't hear about anywhere else. It's a cross of a cross of a cross of a cross of different varieties from France, hence the name Madeleine Angevin. And uh, we end up with a wine that looks like this. So, um, the experience of drinking rosé in this country hasn't always been great. I just put my nose in and, and smelling nice things is a is such a catharsis to my memory. I, I would, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, that smells quite nice. So well done, guys. Um, well done, you lot there again. Uh, Give it all, Rosé 2019, fresh off the bat. Uh, price down below, I don't think it's more than about £15. Uh, but it's a very, very, very nice Rosé. So refreshing. So lovely and bright and fresh. Tastes like red currants and rose hips. Oh, you could smash a lot of that. Very, very nice one. Okay, moving on. This is Furley Estate. Now, Furley Estate is the first Dorset wine I've ever recommended on any show or any newspaper or any TV show, for that matter. And Furley Estate make a lot of nice things. They make a decent fizz as well. And what they've got here is a wine which, along with the wine from Giffords Hall, is... A great variety. This is 100% Pinot Noir, where they haven't bothered to... They might have drained the vat initially to make a red wine, but I imagine what they're doing is making a white wine out of a still wine that I think, having tasted it, is perfectly suited to sparkling wine production, but they want to make a different style of wine. When I look at that, it's pale, pale, you know, proper white wine. Um, Two-thirds of all champagne made is made from Pinot Noir or Meunier, in Champagne. It's one of the largest producers. Of this. If it wasn't for that, France wouldn't be the, the second largest producer of Pinot Noir in the world after California. It'd be lower than Germany. Um, sparkling wine, as I say, is usually made from red varieties. But if you squeeze a red grape, a Pinot Noir grape, in Champagne or in Dorset, and it comes like that. It comes out white. So if you don't tell people it's made from red grape, they don't expect it to smell red either. And when you smell this, it's really delicious. It smells lemony. It's got a bit of spice. It's, it smells like it's been aged on its leaves. The dead yeast cells have been in the wine for a little while. It's only 12% alcohol. I think they both are roughly that. There's only 11, in fact. Um, I'm just going to say it's perfectly delicious. Um, it does taste like the base wine... Um, the Van Clare of making a sparkling wine in Australia or something like that, where they shouldn't be making sparkling wines out of it because the wine's frankly already delicious, refreshing and unctuous. And even though it's made from Pinot Noir, there's something very Chardonnay about it. You can see that Chardonnay and Pinot Noir have some connection, have some lineage in common, um, because this wine does taste like a very, very good little Macon. And if you're buying Macon in France, that's costing you 11 or 12 quid, and it's not far off that price below. Very good. Okay, two more to go. Um, shout out again to my friend John Warrenchak, um, winemaker down at Denby's. And this is a, a, a project that's made in conjunction with Denby's, which was the largest wine estate in the world, uh, in, in England, when it was planted. Uh, I think it was 260 acres or something, 1989, 86, eight, around that time. And uh, John's been working as a consultant winemaker there for many, many years. This one is called Element 20. Uh, this is from 2014, so we're looking at a wine which is six years old. And this wine isn't made from straight Chardonnay, but in fact made from three different varieties. Chardonnay, Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc. The wine's been partially aged in oak. It's got a dark colour. And that colour that you see there is the colour not of lots of oak, but the colour of a bit of age with some very well-managed oak. It's a, it's a sexier colour altogether to see a wine that looks like it's starting to have a patina and a bit of gravitas. It's like wrinkles around the eyes. Sometimes it makes a person look nicer than if they didn't have them. Again, this is quite low in alcohol. It's only 12%. It's bright. 
It's fresh. I can see why they held it back, actually, because the wine's still got plenty of acidity. 14 was a decent year in the UK. It's almost buttery, like Chardonnay used to be. Please go back to the English wine um, show that I did before. Have another look at the Bacchuses, because they made a Bacchus called um, Litmus Orange. And it is an absolute work of art, and it's currently the best white wine, I think, available in the UK. Check it out. £15, you'll be um, blown away what it can do. Great food wine. This is theoretically their super, super premium, and it's quite delicious. I imagine it's more expensive. <clears throat> if you like your Chardonnay-styled wines, any more conventionally oaked wines, I'm sure you'll find this a real surprise. Um, but this is another chance to advertise Litmus Orange, my favourite English white wine in the world right now. Okay, so <clears throat> we're coming on to uh, sparkling wine. No English tasting is complete without one. This is Hambledon, which was a vineyard that was planted in 1952 by the uh, vineyard manager from Paul Roger and was given as a gift to General Sir General Guy Salisbury Jones, um, who was the first person to grow table wine in this country, I believe. And it's pretty much been continually growing wine since. Um, went into kind of disrepute in the sort of early 90s when the current owner, Ian Kellett, very astute, uh, wine degree trained he got him he got himself a wine making degree later on in his career uh, but also um uh, an expert financial analyst of food companies uh and he worked the numbers and said look why wouldn't i buy a place like this it's got history it's got heritage the first game of cricket ever played was played in halfpenny green which is on the estate pretty much um it's it's got so much going for it not least the curate's egg which is the whole of this part of the valley, the whole of Mian Valley, the whole of the of that Winchester Downs is planted on chalk, very deep chalk, <coughs> which is the reason why the producers around Hampshire, for my in my opinion, and not forgetting Chapel Downs, Kitts Coty, which is a small amount of chalk found in North Kent, are in a league of their own in terms of potential going forward. Chardonnay grown in chalk to make sparkling wine is is a is a marriage which so far we've not discovered a better alternative to and if you look at the finest chardonnays in the world that are sparkling Claude de Menil from Krug that's 800 quid a bottle it's grown in the same exact chalk that this is that skein of chalk goes under the English Channel and then appears in Hampshire and they're using the same clones of chardonnay they're even using the same quality of press Ian very um it was a visionary, really, but um, with one of the best uh, champagne winemakers in the world, Hervé Gestin. Shout out to you. He used to be chef de carve at Duvalois, has worked for all the top names, has made nearly a quarter of a billion bottles of sparkling of champagne in the world, and now he's a consultant winemaker here. They bought cockard presses. A cockard press is a horizontal flat press, very special design, super high tech, and costs a shitload of money. And nobody buys a cockard press unless they are planning to make the world's best sparkling wines. So let's have a look at this, shall we? So this is made from primarily, well, the, the magic in it is primarily Chardonnay grown on chalk. <clears throat> but they also grow Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. The sort of, the, the food groups required to make champagne. And uh, they've had an extraordinary level of success since they started um, selling wine in 2010, 11, um, and they've won many, many, many awards. And uh, I think if you're looking on the balance of things, uh, they are, along with maybe three or four other producers in this country, going to be world famous very soon. Um, quite extraordinary wines. What's great about them is you're not paying a king's ransom yet. This wine, £29.50, it's £30. You can buy some Waitrose. I think you can buy it in. Um, the M and S sell it. Um, it's now being imported by a company called, or well, imported, distributed, should I say, a company called Mensendorf. So look at uh, if you ask them uh, and you're a restaurant, then find out about the other wines they sell. They make an extraordinary rosé. They make an extraordinary upscale wine. Um, the the top cuvee they make um, is 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 like Krug. It's incredible. Anyway, so let's smell and taste this. Nose is beautiful. Light smell of brioche. So sort of, uh, straight out of the oven, butter buns. Lovely acidity, but that's what England does, right? Wine needs maybe another six months to really settle down. Tastes like it's made from quite a young base. Delicious and ripe. I'm guessing probably 16 now, maybe, because it's got lovely acidity. 15 was a really rich vintage, but it was a little hotter. Made great rosés. 
Um, but this wine tastes like it may be made from 16, 15, 14, something like that. But it's a non-vintage wine blended from multiple vintages. Uh, some wine in this wine, about 8% of it, I believe, has been aged in, in proper expensive oak barrels too. Well, certainly in this country, you can't spend £30 better than that. For those people that know, they know that I've worked with this company. I was consulting with them from right from the beginning. And uh, a shout from the rooftops because I'm very proud of what they're doing. And delicious. So, Gifford's Hall Rosé, Madeleine Orangevin and Pinot Noir mixed together. Furley Estate from Dorset. Shout out to Weymouth and Lime. Uh, Blue Vinny Cheese and all the other wonderful things that come out of there. The Sir Navis Giant. Anyway, then we've got from Dorking, which is Surrey. Element 20, made by John Warren Jack. Cheers, mate. And uh, Mike Florence, general manager. Nice to uh, shout out to you as well. And then Ian Kellett and all the guys down there. Felix. Fantastic sparkling wine. That's 15 minutes of English Wine Week joy. Go and spoil yourselves. Cheers. Next time.